34 and 35 of Isaiah um, are an interesting couple of chapters. Uh, the chapters we've just covered, chapters 28 through 33, we call those the woes, largely because of the uh, six chapters included in that section. Five of them began with the word woe. I didn't point that out, I don't think, in our last session, but that was something you might have noticed and I had pointed out on an earlier occasion. The chapters 34 and 35 are kind of sandwiched in between these woe chapters and a very striking section in chapters 36 through 39, which are just historical. Uh, Chapters 36 through 39 simply relate history, which is found elsewhere also in 2 Kings, uh, and also in Second Chronicles. So when we get to chapters 36 through 39, we're not going to be dealing with prophetic utterances per se, but with uh, a, a transition in the book that kind of, uh, what it does is the first two chapters of those, 36 and 37, talk about the problems with Assyria, and then 38 and 39 talk about the problems with Babylon, which is much later time in Israel's history, so that those four chapters that give historical setting transfer our thinking from the Assyrian period, which we've been in this whole time, till and chapter 40 and following, mostly the focus on the Babylonian period. If you don't follow what I just said, you, I'll be able to explain that more in detail when we get into that section. But in between that historical section and the section we've just completed are these two chapters, which definitely belong together. Uh, there is a marked contrast, for instance, in the end of chapter 34, especially verse uh, 10 to the end of the chapter, and what is presented in chapter 35. Now, the meaning of these chapters is not agreed upon by all Christians. I have my own beliefs about uh, how we're to understand them, and I will share those with you. Uh, But what I'd like to do, first of all, is read chapter 34 by itself, and uh, without making comments at first, so that you can sort of get your own impressions about what you think it's talking about. I would suggest that it may not be talking about what it appears at first glance to be talking about. Uh, You'll definitely get a a profound impression right from the beginning that you'll probably think you know what it's talking about. But then there will be some other elements that will be introduced later as we read through the chapter that will call the original impression into question in your mind. Come near, ye nations, to hear. And hearken, ye people, let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of uh, their carcasses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a fig, or as a falling fig from a fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorns shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls. And their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch and the dust thereof into brimstone. And the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it and the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof, 
and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court of four owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. And he hath cast the lot for them, and his, his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever, from generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Now, one of the great problems with this chapter is at the beginning, in the first four verses, or the first five verses, it would seem that we're talking about the end of the world. Because it says, it's, it's addressed to the nations, in the plural, in verse 1. And in verse 2 it says, uh, the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, which sounds fairly universal. The, all the nations of the world would seem to be in view. And then in verse 4 it says, all the host of heaven, which usually refers to the stars in the skies, shall be dissolved. The heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, which is also a term mentioned in Psalm 102, about uh, the, the heavens being rolled together as a scroll in Psalm 102, verse 26. Uh, and all their hosts, principally usually meaning the angels, shall fall down as the leaf, I'm not, not the angels, the, the stars. Sometimes the stars represent angels, but the host of heaven ordinarily would refer to stars. Uh, as I said, sometimes they will symbolize angels. In this case, I can't be certain. As the leaf falleth from the vine and as a falling fig from the tree. Uh, this reference to the falling fig from the tree, the stars falling like that, is something Jesus himself Picked up. He used the same imagery in Matthew 24:29, 29, uh, when he was talking, as we'll, we'll discuss the Olivet Discourse before very long in our studies in Matthew, but um, he was talking about what some people understand to be the end of the world and what some people understand to be the fall of Jerusalem. But I'll just read the verses in Matthew so you'll see the similarity. Um, Matthew 24, 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Uh, if we turn over to Luke's parallel, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Luke in Luke 21 <coughs> actually makes reference. I might be mistaken. I, I guess I, I was thinking he made reference to the figs falling there also, but he does not. At any rate, you can see in Matthew 24, 29, he borrows a lot of the images of the sun being darkened, the moon not giving her light, the stars falling from heaven. And because of our tendency to take this passage literally, many people understand that Jesus' statement to be a reference to the end of the world. Others, feeling that he's using merely apocalyptic language, think that that's talking about the fall of Jerusalem, which took place in 70 AD. Now, if Isaiah is to give us any clues as to how to interpret this language, we found, of course, in Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10 that the fall of Babylon was said to be accompanied by the sun and the moon being darkened and the stars falling from the heavens or not giving their light and uh, that was not a literal phenomenon that took place when Babylon fell it was figurative it was apoc apocalyptic language in this case in, Ma in Isaiah 34 we have cause to wonder is this talking about a literal destruction of the universe uh, when Jesus returns uh, and, destroy, and judges all the nations. Up to this point, everything in chapter 34 would seem to imply that that is the case. However, we must wonder, because there are cases where that kind of language is not used literally, but where it is used figuratively, we might ask, is it figurative here? Um, if we go on, he begins to talk about Idumea, which is another longer form of the name Edom. The Edomites, the Idumeans, were the descendants from Esau, who was, of course, Jacob's brother, and therefore the two races of people were close uh, as far as racially, but they were very distant in brotherly affection. The two nations were hostile to each other historically, and the Idumeans were the people of God's curse, as he said. And he says in verse 5 that his sword would come down upon Idumea. Uh, in verse 6, 
he speaks of the blood of lambs and goats, the fat of kidneys of rams, which are, of course, the things that were ordinarily offered in sacrifice. But in this case, he's not speaking literally of those things. He's talking about how the slaughter of the Idumeans would be his sacrifice, and it's like the blood of animals and the fat of animals being poured out <coughs> at the altar. He's saying, essentially, God is it has a sacrifice. In verse 6, he says, The Lord hath made a sacrifice in Bozrah, which was the capital of Edom, or major city of Edom, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. So, the difficulty that we encounter so far is that the first verses sound like it's the end of the world, with the heavens you know, being rolled up, the stars falling from the, from the air, uh, uh, God having indignation upon all nations, his judgment coming on all nations. And then we have Idumea mentioned. The reason that's a problem is Idumea doesn't exist anymore. It came under total and final judgment before Jesus was ever born. In the whole Old Testament period, the fall of Edom was predicted by most of the prophets. Um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of them had words of judgment for Edom. Um, uh, some of the minor prophets, Obadiah, for instance, prophesied against Edom uh, completely. His whole prophecy was against Edom. And Edom fell. Edom fell to mainly Nabataean uh, tribal peoples that came through and raided their area. And by the time of Jesus, there was only one family of Idumeans left, and that was the Herods. Uh, Herod the Great and his offspring were the last Edomites known to history by the year 70 A.D. Uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed, there was not a single person with Edomite blood known to be in the world. So if we're talking about the end of the world here, it's rather surprising to find him talking about judging Edom or Idumea because that nation has already been judged. That's history as far as we're concerned. And yet the end of the world is not yet history. So to see these two things put together makes us wonder. One of the two thoughts must be symbolic. Now, one way to understand it is that Idumea is symbolic, that it's not really speaking about Edom, but since Edom was a historic enemy of the Jews, he just mentions them here as, a, as a, an example of hostile nations. And basically, he'd said earlier that his indignation is really on all nations, but that he singles one nation out, uh, not necessarily one that will come under judgment at the end of the world, but one which is a historic enemy of the Jews, and uh, that he singles them out as a sample <coughs> or a representative of all the evil nations that will be judged, and some understand it that way, and therefore they still have it at the end of the world that this is describing. And while it's not literal that Edom is judged at that time, yet wicked nations are judged, of which Edom is suggested as a representative. Um, my tendency is to take the other side as symbolic, to take Idumea as literal, and the earlier part of the passage is symbolic. Now, either way of taking it is possible, and one of those two ways seems to be necessary. Like I said, we can't have the literal destruction of literal Edom at the literal end of the world. That's, it's too late for that, you know? Uh, so either Idumea is not literal, or else those passages that seem to be talking about the end of the world are not literal. And either possibility is, is a viable one. My preference, and the reason it's a preference, is basically due to my personal uh, appraisal of the way the prophets use language and also because of the context of this whole passage as you'll see why when we get to the latter part of this chapter and the next chapter my belief is that probably the first four verses are apocalyptic language not literal that this chapter really is about the destruction of Edom for the most part that it's uh, it, it really is talking about something that has n at this time already been fulfilled and the references to the hosts of heaven being dissolved, the heavens being rolled up as a scroll, that this is very much like the, the wording at the Bab fall of Babylon where the sun and the moon cease to give their light. It didn't literally happen, but these are just uh, kinds of language that are used to suggest a, uh, an overwhelming uh, change in the status quo, obviously, I mean, to put it mildly. And uh, that is, that's the way the prophets speak. Um, and to say his indignation is on all nations, perhaps he's saying that his judgment, which is, going, is at this point focused on Idumea, is simply a sampling of the way he will ultimately judge all nations that forget God. All nations that are wicked can expect a similar thing eventually. But at this point, the prophet is focusing on the destruction of Edom. Now, 
depending on who you read on this passage, or maybe depending on how you, you look at it yourself, you can see it either way. The passage could be about the end of the world, and Edom is symbolic of all the wicked nations, or else it's literally about Edom, and the passages that, that speak of a universal judgment are symbolic. As I said, I take it largely to be about Edom, literally. And there's another reason for that. Because of the way the chapter ends, um, in verse 8, for instance, it says, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. Uh, and he says, And the streams thereof shall be turned to pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. Now, whether this is speaking of Idumea's land or Zion's is not clear immediately because verse 8 ends with mention of Zion. But it would seem that the following words in the, in, the, in the passage would be still talking about Idumea or it's possible even that the prophet's mind has shifted over to a spiritual thing. And I'll tell you why as we read the passage and especially as we look at the following chapter. But he says in verse 10, it shall not be quenched night nor day. Now he's basically said that the land, let's say for the moment that he's talking about the land of Edom, the land will essentially be turned into burning pitch It'll be like it's on fire all the time. And it shall not be quenched day or night, and the smoke thereof shall go up forever. Now, to say the smoke thereof shall go up forever, some might say, well, then that must be a reference to uh, the end of the world. Because if you go over to where Edom was today, you don't see smoke going up forever and ever right now. However, again, we need to appreciate the way language is used. If you look with me at the book of Jude... The book of Jude in verse 7. It says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now here it says that Sodom and Gomorrah are an example to us as they are suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean they've gone to hell and therefore they're in eternal fire? I suppose that's probably the, the easiest way for us to take it. And that may be exactly how we should understand it. Uh, on the other hand, it may be that he's saying that the, the, the judgment that came upon them f with fire out of heaven that consumed them is something that had eternal continuing ramifications. That is, they've never re been restored. Their judgment was final and forever and ever. <coughs> Uh, though the fire isn't still burning there, yet they are forever judged. They're not ever going to come back. They're, they're, they're not going to have their day again. That uh, we could understand that the fire that came upon them brought an eternal judgment upon them as a judgment that was final and will not be revoked. Or we could understand it as a reference to hell. Now, interestingly, our language here about Edom in, in Isaiah, uh, that its fire shall not be quenched day nor night, that and, and the smoke thereof shall go up forever and ever. If you look at Revelation 14.11, we have this very same language echoed. In fact, John clearly borrows the language from Isaiah 34 uh, about hell, about the lake of fire. Uh, when it describes how those who worship the beast will be thrown in the lake of fire, it says in Revelation 14.11, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever make, receiveth the mark of his name. Now it says, The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Look what it says in our passage in Isaiah. It shall not be quenched day nor night, and the smoke thereof goes up forever and ever. Sounds very, very similar use of language, and since Revelation is constantly borrowing language from the Old Testament, I am convinced that John was using language from this very passage. Now, we might say, well, does that mean then, since John used this language of the lake of fire, <coughs> that Isaiah is therefore talking about the lake of fire? Um, maybe, maybe not. It's, it's difficult to say. Well, he doesn't appear to be talking about the lake of fire because he seems to be talking about streams turned to pitch and the dust of the ground turned to brimstone. But then again, maybe he's talking about hell in language that is like a, a place where the streams don't run water, they run lava, you know, and the ground is like constantly burning brimstone. Now, it is a possibility, but then Isaiah 34 presents some other problems in that interpretation. 
They're not insurmountable, but they are problems that arise just on a casual reading of it. And that is that in verses 11 through 17, the, the remaining part of Isaiah 34, he describes the desolation as though it's a wilderness. And he talks about birds uh, and animals living there, which are the kinds of creatures that live in a desert. Uh, it's the same kind of animals that are mentioned in chapter 14 that would inhabit Babylon after it fell. Uh, you might remember at the end of, uh, or not, no, the end of chapter 13, I'm sorry, the end of chapter 13 of Isaiah, after the fall of Babylon, he says it will be uninhabited, it will never be rebuilt, it will be the home of the owls and the, and the cormorant and, the, and these creatures that are mentioned here. So these creatures are mentioned generally as a reflection of the fact that when judgment comes, all that's left is a wilderness. Now, if we take it literally, then what do we do? If we make this chapter about the judgment of the world at the end of the world, then where, I mean, if we take this literally, then it, what it would be saying is after God wipes out the wicked at the end of the world and uh, they're relegated to eternal fire, then the world will just be inhabited by animals for forever and ever because it actually says that forever and ever. Um, it says in verse 17, he hath cast the lot for them that is to say, he's given this to these animals as their inheritance, as they cast lots for the inheritance of the land of Israel. God has cast the lot for these birds and these animals, and his hand has divided it to them by line. The, the language is as if God has turned the world over to these creatures as their inheritance, just like God gave the Jews an inheritance by line and by casting of lots in the promised land. It says, they shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. Well, the problem there, of course, is that all the clear passages that of eschatology in the scripture indicate that when Jesus comes back, uh, the elements will melt with a fervent heat, uh, the earth will be <coughs> dissolved, and the heavens too will burn up with fire, and then he'll make a new heavens and a new earth. You can read, for instance, Second Peter chapter 3 to give a clear teaching like that. You get it from other parts of the Bible as well. You don't get the impression that after Jesus comes back, he's just going to wipe out the wicked and then the earth will continue forever and ever inhabited only by desert animals. Uh, if this is an eschatological literal statement about a literal future final punishment on the earth, then it, it kind of conflicts with other eschatological thoughts in the Bible because the Bible does not teach that this present earth will continue forever and ever, but that it'll be destroyed and replaced with a new heaven and new earth. And yet the way it's written here he seems to be describing a continuing wilderness with these birds of the wilderness living in this place for, well, it literally says forever and ever, from generation to generation. Now, at this point, it's important for me to point out that all of this kind of language can be found in other parts of the Bible in non-literal usage. That doesn't mean it's always non-literal, and it might not be non-literal here. A person who says, I take this literally, is welcome to do so. But I do think that if we take all of this literally, we're going to have some problems with our, our picture of what the end of the world has in store. If we take it figuratively, then it's very much like the burdens against some of the other nations that we've already read about in the earlier chapters. It's very much like the burden against Babylon, as I pointed out several times already in, in chapter 13, the reference to the luminaries in the heavens uh, ceasing to, uh, to go on and giving their light uh, is a similarity. The reference to the place being inhabited by wilderness creatures forever. Uh, the place is never built again. Its judgment is perpetual or eternal. Uh, that agrees again with what it was said about Babylon. Uh, there's every reason in my mind to think that this is literally talking about the judgment of the nation Idumea, which is named in it. Bozra is mentioned by name, uh, which was a specific city in Idumea in verse 6. And that we're just talking in figurative language here about how God's going to wipe out Idumea and they'll never be restored. The area that they used to live in will just be inhabited by wilderness creatures. If you go to the region that was Idumea today, it's in the Arabian Desert, uh, you will find that it's not other than the prophet speaks. So it seems to me the natural way to understand it is that. Now, what I want to stress is how much how many verses, eight verses, 11 through 17, are given to a detailed description of the wilderness condition of the place? It seems like he could have said the same thing in one or two verses, and, uh, and yet he gives a, a long list of the birds and things that will live there. It's almost too burdensome for us to read. 
But I think the reason for that is because of what follows it in chapter 35. And because he starts by talking about the wilderness in chapter 35. And the natural understanding would be he's talking about the wilderness described in chapter 34. But then again, we, we have reason to wonder if the wilderness ever in Isaiah refers to real wilderness or whether blossoming and budding ever refers to real blossoming and budding. I'll show you why in a moment. Let me read chapter 35 and you'll see the obvious contrast between the desolation of chapter 34 and the restoration of chapter 35 and then I'll tell you what some of the leading views are on it and I'll tell you what I think we're supposed to see in this. In chapter 35 it says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. For whom? Apparently for these desert animals that are there. And then it says, And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, meaning it'll be forested like Lebanon, and the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. Now, this is we've, we've seen Lebanon and Carmel mentioned uh, in verses together already before, and they were not likely to have been understood as literal in those previous occasions. And they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. <clears throat> then shall the lame man leap as an heart, which is a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness, again, shall waters break out and streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes, and an highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go upon it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sign shall flee away. By the way, this last statement in chapter 10 is almost identical to another statement later in chapter 51 and verse 11, which is, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. We, some of you probably have sung that verse before. It's set to music, but the one at the end of chapter 35, though worded, the, the, the phrases are put in a different order. It's the same, essentially the same in content. Well, what in the world is this chapter talking about? It is an obvious contrast. What he has done in chapter 34 is talk about God judging someone. Idumea appears to be the, the object of the judgment in chapter 34, but then talks about a perpetual wilderness that is created as the result of this judgment. But then we have the wilderness beginning to blossom as a rose. And a highway is prepared called the way of holiness. And it talks about wonderful things happening, like uh, the blind eyes opening and the deaf ears being unstopped. Now, some people would understand this to be a picture of a future millennial bliss that would be established when Jesus returns and that this is one of those passages, one of those golden age passages like chapter 2 of Isaiah, like chapter 11 of Isaiah, like uh, chapter 65 of Isaiah and, and quite a few other passages in Isaiah. They're about the golden age. They're kingdom passages. They're talking about wonderful blessings that uh, that have never been seen literally up to this present point. And many people are, believe we're supposed to take them quite literally. That, uh, that it's very important for us to realize that the desert areas of the world are going to become a beautiful garden again someday. They're going to blossom uh, and bud as a rose that the, you know, all handicaps will be done away with. And I, I believe, of course, when Jesus comes back that all those things will be true. Uh, but to suggest that this is talking about a future time when Jesus returns is an unnecessary assumption. And, of course, if we take it fully literally, some of these things have not happened, of course, and therefore would have to be future. But the thing is full of images, and many of them are quoted in the New Testament 
has been about Jesus when he came the first time and what he established. Let me give you some examples from this passage. For example, the reference at verse 2 at the end says, They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Let me turn your attention. Keep your finger here. Turn over to Isaiah 40. Verses 3 through 5. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now this passage is quoted in the New Testament by John the Baptist about himself. When he was asked who he was, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And he quoted this verse, or else the gospel writers quoted it about him, so that when we read Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 5, we can be quite sure that it's talking about John the Baptist's ministry at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus at his first coming. And yet, look at the parallels between this short section of verses in chapter 40 and our passage in chapter 35. We've got a highway being prepared in both places. In chapter 35, 8, it says there will be a way there and a highway. Here, John the Baptist is said to be saying, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Well, the desert, the wilderness, is, this, is the background for chapter 35 also. You've got wilderness, you've got a highway, and you've got in chapter 35, 2, the, they shall see the glory of the Lord. Well, that's what it says here in chapter 40, verse 5. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. So, it would seem there's a parallel between chapter 35 and chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. And we have no difficulty identifying the meaning of chapter 40, verses 3 through 5, because of the obvious quotation of it in the New Testament. It is talking about John the Baptist and Jesus and the things that John said were going to be happening immediately upon Jesus' coming. A, a way was to be prepared in the wilderness. Well, was Jesus? did Jesus literally prepare a road going through the wilderness of Judea? I mean, did he, did he literally pave a road for people to travel on? Of course not. We know he didn't do that. Then what did John mean when he said he came to prepare the way of the Lord and make straight the highway for our God and this, this way in the wilderness being prepared? He was obviously talking about something spiritual. He was talking about a way of life so that Jesus later when he said, I am the way, which is spoken of here, it says there shall be a highway and a way we know Jesus was not talking about being a literal road when Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth and the life. But he was talking about he is the way that was described here. If we want to walk in holiness, he is the road. He is the one. Or as John put it in 1 John, I think it's 1 John 2, 6, he says, He that saith he abideth in him ought to walk even as he walked. That is, we walk as Jesus walked. We walk in his way. He is the way. And if we walk in him the way he walked, uh, then we are on the way of holiness. It's, it's not a literal road through a literal wilderness. Now, if that's the case in, in Isaiah 40, which I'm sure is indisputably the case, I mean, obviously, Isaiah 40 is talking about Jesus and John the Baptist at the first coming of Jesus. Therefore, we have reason to believe because of the striking parallels between that and chapter 35 that Isaiah is talking about the same thing in both places. And if the way through the wilderness, if the way isn't a literal way, that is a literal road, then the wilderness might not be referring to a literal wilderness. And I think that we have grounds to suspect that it is not talking about a literal wilderness, especially when we consider that this very motif has come up already a number of times in Isaiah. For instance, if you go back to chapter 32, we read this this morning in verse 15 uh, and 16. Chapter 32, 15, 16, it says, Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high, which I say re refers to the day of Pentecost, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Then judgment, or justice, shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. Now, in saying the wilderness will become a fruitful field, what's the difference between that and what we're reading in Isaiah 35? As near as I can tell, nothing. There's no difference. And yet, Chapter 32, verse 15, appears to be talking about the day of Pentecost and the resultant fruitfulness in the lives of persons whose lives were fruitless before. In other words, the imagery of chapter 32 and verse 15 leads me at least to believe the wilderness is a condition of a person's soul. 
that is made fruitful as the result of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon it. And if that's the case in, in chapter 32, then we have strong reason to suspect it may be the case in chapter 35. Is there anything else that would lead us to that impression, or am I just kind of sh taking a shot in the dark? Let me turn your attention for a moment to Jeremiah 31, which also is a New Covenant passage. Jeremiah 31. I see this as a very interesting parallel because in Ch Jeremiah 31, 31, we have a very familiar passage, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. And so it goes. Now, that is a familiar passage which obviously refers to the new covenant that Jesus established at the Last Supper when he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, made with many for the remission of sin. So, Jeremiah 31 is talking about the covenant of which we are partakers. Look earlier in the same chapter of Jeremiah 31 and verse 12. Jeremiah 31, 12. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion. Now, does that sound like the end of Isaiah 35? Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion with everlasting joy on their heads. Sounds like a parallel. Listen to this. Jeremiah 31, 12. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together unto the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine, for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd and their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Now, there's the watered garden. But what is it that's like a watered garden? Their soul. The watered garden that was once a wilderness is a condition of soul. It's a spiritual condition of individuals. Now, if we transform, uh, trans, how would I say, transport that idea over into Isaiah, and I do believe we have reason to do so because of the seeming obvious parallels in those thoughts. Isaiah and Jeremiah are both writing about the golden age which happens to be fulfilled in Christ uh, in the church. Then all of these passages in Isaiah about the fruitful field, about the wilderness becoming a fruitful field, uh, speak to us about a spiritual condition in our souls. Jeremiah said their soul shall be as a watered garden. And that makes heaps of sense if we see that in the Isaiah passages. The one we were just considering is Isaiah 32, 15. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field. And the fruitful field be counted a forest. In other words, it just gets more and more lush. It's, first it's a fruitful field, then goes beyond that. We become as strong as oaks, strong as, strong as trees. And doesn't Isaiah say later in Isaiah 61, 3, we should be called... the trees, the planting of the Lord, trees of righteousness, Isaiah 61.3. Once we get used to Isaiah's way of using language, some things come a little clearer at sin. Once we realize that almost everything he's talking about is spiritualized in the New Testament and even in some other Old Testament passages that's spiritualized, then we can understand that the things we're reading about are fulfilled in our lives, in Christ. When the Spirit is poured out upon us, then what do we have? The fruit of the Spirit. Our lives were fruitless before, but they, it was like a wilderness. But now we're like a fruitful field, producing fruit for God. And uh, so these passages, and there are many of them in, in Isaiah that talk about a fruitful field and the wilderness being transformed, we might have strong reason to suspect that none of them are talking about a literal transformation of land, as, as we would understand it to be if we took it literally. I think I mentioned before that there are some teachers I've heard who take this absolutely literally. And they think it's talking about a future millennium when all the <coughs> deserts will be gardens. And, uh, and I think I mentioned that it's, all, it's been pointed out by one teacher that Israel, uh, which is a desert area, is being cultivated and they've got all kinds of uh, irrigation ditches and so forth and they're turning it into a beautiful garden. And that one passage in Isaiah we already considered said that they will fill the earth with their fruit and this teacher says, well, it's interesting that Israel today supplies a third of the world's citrus fruits and so forth. And he understands this to be a literal thing about the literal transformation of the land of Israel. But to my mind, Isaiah is talking about the new covenant. He's talking about when the Holy Spirit was poured out. He's talking about 
things which, which have their counterpart in our spiritual lives. Let me show you a few other passages in Isaiah. Some of them we've already covered and some of them have yet to come up. But they have to do with uh, comparing, you know, the, the, using this motif of the fruitful field. One is, uh, well, we already saw 29.17, uh, is not a very little while and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field shall be esteemed a forest. I don't know if you remember how we dealt with that the other day when we covered it, but uh, the passage that follows that in Isaiah 29 seems to be talking about the church. And as I understand it, it seems to be talking about the blessings of the new covenant. And uh, then, of course, we have, uh, we can go further into the future in Isaiah chapter 41 and verses 18 and 19. Chapter 41, 18 and 19 says, I will open rivers in the high places and fountains in the midst of valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Sounds like chapter 35. I will plant in the wilderness the cedar, the shiddah tree, the myrtle, and the oil tree, and I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Now, what is that talking about? Um, if you look at the verse prior to that that I read in verse 17, the, when the poor and the needy seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Does that remind you of anything Jesus said? When the poor and needy seek water and there is none. Jesus stood up at the great feast of tabernacles in John chapter 7. He said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And as the scripture hath said, out of his bowels shall flow rivers of living water, which he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Here, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink, and I'll give him the water, he says. It sounds an awful lot like when the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue fails, I, the Lord, will hear them. I will not forsake them. And then he goes on to describe opening rivers in the high places. Out of his bowels shall flow rivers of living water, Jesus said. So there seem to be some parallels in thought here between what Jesus offers to us through giving us the Holy Spirit, through the conditions of coming under the new covenant, through becoming Christians, in other words, and what was described here. He talks about fruitfulness. He talks about trees. These are all images that Isaiah uses to speak of our spiritual condition, I believe. In Isaiah 54... Verse. No, that's not that's not a that's not a parallel. I thought we had a parallel in Isaiah 54. There, my notes are wrong. Isaiah 55, however, verses 10 through 13 is interesting to note in this connection. Isaiah 55:10, for as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Sound like the wilderness turning into a garden. The water comes down. Uh, it, it causes plants to grow. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Now, what's he talking about there? He talks about just like the rain comes down on the earth and makes it become...